This week on Hermitcraft. Mini games. More on that now, actually. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is Loy XP, and each week we hunt for overarching themes in the videos we compile into this silly show. Some weeks we have to really reach for it, because Hermitcraft is not a single piece of art lending itself to analysis. Other weeks, there's three different people all finishing their minigame builds, one of which nearly the entire whitelist participates in. We'll go more into that later, but it's still funny how Mumbo's Storage Wars, Cub Fan's Ravager Run, Iskal's Siege of Doom, and the conclusion to the Ryder Cup golf competition are all either ongoing, finished, or actively recruiting participants in the same week. Now, this is called Siege of Doom. I instantly know who has made this. For now, we'll just congratulate Team America with their victory on the golf course and the inevitable acquisition of Canada, apparently. And with that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Full disclosure, we don't actually support annexing Canada. It's a Joe Hills joke. Relax. Speaking of Joe Hills and the aftermaths of golf, Joe returns his clubs to the club and himself to the Hermitage, the better to put windows in the southern face. Yeah, because the sun sets in the west over there. So, yeah, this is the... No, this is the southern face. Hey, I have a southern face! But that's not the only time he visits Concorp land this week, as he returns after the second round to claim his winnings on behalf of Team USA. And the thing he wants is that trident from the figure atop the enormous gold trophy, to replace the one he lost in the wither catastrophe of 2019. Not to mention gloating over that one time he heisted some Concorp diamonds in plain sight of everyone. Core concept! Everybody left a bunch of diamonds on the ground. Good game, Asuma, picking 15 diamonds up off the ground. Uh, good game, false symmetry, picking 15 diamonds off off the ground. And boom, I have officially heisted 30 Concorp diamonds. Naturally, the best course of action is to return the bling to the Brits, which he just might do because he bet all of it on Storage Wars after treating us to his best mumbo jumbo impersonation. Welcome to Storage Wars. Beating opens at 8 British Standard Time on the 7th of June or the 6th of July. So what is Storage Wars, I hear you ask? Storage Wars on the Hermitcraft server! Thanks, Rendog. Grab some of the bidding chips and rename them to your IGN. There are five different storage containers, all with different items on the inside. The door will open for about five seconds. You can only open each door once. You must then place your bid based on what you have briefly seen. Now, in order to determine the value of these lockers, my friends, we need to delve deep into the psychology of the Mumbo. When Ren isn't trying to pick apart Mumbo's mind games, he stops by Azuma's modern district station to compliment it on its modernity, and registers for the first playtest of Siege of Doom while he's there. I've been following this project on Iskal's channel like an eagle, and I cannot wait to play. Back at the fantasy district, he reminds everyone that the plan is to become a firework merchant, and sets up Wither Rose-powered creeper farms next to his dojo of tranquility. So now the peaceful sound of rushing water is complemented by the distant hissing of dying creepers. At least it gets him three stacks of gunpowder every hour or so. Doc M has finished blowing things up underground, but he's still having some fun with the Boom Boom Pow at the testing ground for Doc Systems. Okay. Blew up. After doing something weird with pistons and end crystals that, to be honest, neither of us completely understood, he actually manages to generate some of those super ghost blocks that don't allow anything to be placed in that space, until he comes along with some TNT and blows up the nothingness. Basically, he can now create barrier blocks, but in survival, and we should all be very afraid. Re Relog, and all of a sudden, invisible. So if I wanted to, and I knew about this for a bit, I could have stopped the whole race to the top. <laughs> just by placing an invisible barrier of impenetrable blocks. Like the rest of the server though, he can't resist the call of the minigames, signing up to Iskal's PvP game while complaining about it costing diamonds, then being very suspicious of Azuma's free wool shop. But trolling someone for money, now that he understands. But you know, I know Mambo is a good guy, so he probably wouldn't troll too hard with this whole dealio. But you never know, he's also friends with Green. Azuma himself takes a page from Doc's book, you know, the one he wrote about zero-tick pistons. Having jolted the flying machines of his kelp farm back into their usual swing... Okay, that's how we know this farm is working. <laughs> I've got very little frame rate. Azuma still needs some fuel to smelt it with. A bamboo farm comes in handy, but naturally it's the somewhat exploity Il Mango one, the same design as in Doc's compost basement. And you can see it's sending the bamboo all the way over there. It looks like it's doing it very consistently. 
To bounce back from the cash bet on Storage Wars, Azuma calls up Saharian representative Iskal85 for an exclusivity deal and some on-the-spot sales. Now that the Wither Rose farm is tweaked and more reliable, it only makes sense to revisit the offer. This and I said, first I thought it was a Sahara thing, but I don't think this is good for Sahara. I mean, I'm, I'm coming along here to partner up, right, is the idea. <clears throat> oh uh, yeah, right. Am I partnering with the right company? Yes. In accordance with the contract signed and agreed upon, he will now provide Wither Roses from his farm to Sahara and Sahara only, leaving them to potentially crank up the price however they want with no repercussions or competition. The food display he suggested last week doesn't fare quite as well. Sahara, Sahara is not a restaurant. Good, good idea for a business branch in the future, but we're not a, we're not a restaurant, so we're, we're gonna, we want customers to be hungry so they buy our golden carrots. So despite looking like IKEA, Sahara is not going to start selling Swedish meatballs. But it is selling a few more things now. Thanks to Grian's off-camera grinding and Iskal loading up the machine, Sahara now has one full row of its storage system filled. It doesn't hurt that Iskal's overproductive guardian farm gets a fully decked out storage room of its own, so he can craft sea lanterns by the shulker box load anytime he likes. Eventually, even the cod will be traded away to some villager fishermen. A fisherman's workstation is actually a barrel, and I'm not gonna lie, there's a good chance that these barrels will be filled with just junk, because that's normally what I do when I have a spare chest. The next step for Iskal is to build a tunnel from the farm back to his Mushroom Island, but that gets delayed by a more important tunnel, one from the Mushroom Island back to anything else resembling civilization. After a lot of work, it is spawn-proof, although not exactly Grian-proof. I, I, wanna, I wanna take a bet, okay? I wanna take a bet. How long will it take before Grian comes to my nether or comes to my base and does this as he runs back? <laughs> so when you come running down, you just bonk into one of these and you can't go any further. And even though he's just made a more efficient road back to the shopping district, Iskal decides he's given Rendog enough of his diamonds this season and sets up his own TNT wood factory so he can continue to build all the other kinds of factory without shelling out the big bucks. With building habits on display, it seems Wells Knight could use a contraption like that since nearly all of his lakeside manor not near a lake is made of planks. I just want to build in peace, please. Now that the outer shell of it is finished, Wells tackles the interior problem, which is that there is no interior. Before long, a floor plan is established, corridors laid out, walls risen, and all that's left to do is let the happy residents move in with their stuff. Then maybe convince his own comment section that it's okay to call a foyer a welcome room. I guess you would call it like, uh, this would be like the, the, the welcome room, if you will. If you'd prefer an unwelcome room, look no further than TFC. Last week we mentioned him not being sure how to flip a room upside down, and this week he nails it with some help from the comments section reminding him that polished diorite slabs are a thing. Great job with that, by the way. After doing the same thing for the room that's made entirely of diorite, making it even less comfortable than before, TFC makes himself more comfortable by purchasing one of Stress Monster's suits of stacking protection armor. It's worth noting the server hasn't updated yet, so it's still possible for him to make the armor himself, but when you've got five stacks of diamond blocks, you may as well spend them every now and again. Mending projectile, fire, and blast protection. The so-called god armor. Now, I do have an Elytra. I know people are all the time telling me, and I, it's very rare that I actually use it, and the reason for that is my internet connection. Cub fans' interiors are on the flip side. They're the only haven safe from the madness that is the running of the Ravages. I can imagine it's going to be a pretty panicked button press uh, here. <laughs> Made to be coloured wall dispensing spots as a way of getting points in the competition, the small apartments Cub builds refuse to be just that. Each of them are a unique and believable living space with varying degrees of weirdness. Some even affect gameplay by offering secret passages, crawl tunnels, and windowsill parkour segments that would help a player escape the balls that might have gotten too up close and personal with the usual door-shaped openings. Most also have no other exit but through the second story window. So ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I feel like the city is basically complete. And also the areas where players are going to be frequenting the most, like the houses in here. Uh, these are super detailed inside here. The players will have to find their way to these spots of tranquility based on what spots a local randomizer tells them to go. That and a point scoring system to keep track of who got what reside right at the entrance to the decorative town as a lobby for before the race begins. Yeah, this area is looking awesome. This area is looking awesome. 
A much more lively atmosphere presents itself over at Zombie Cleo's Tortumbler Island now that the residents filled in the second story of the tavern. You know, the one with a pub in it. Though drinking and pumpkin seed snacks are outweighed heavily by the nerd points, seeing as how in the same room with bartender Rendog there are a group of D&D playing pirates role-playing as other pirates in a situation eerily similar to the one they're in, a group of hobbits three minutes away from one ringing it up, and of course Zombie Cleo herself sitting at the entrance pondering her life choices. That's the third Zombie Cleo in this area, by the way, if you count the real one. There we go, Hermit Pub. So, uh, Ren and Scar behind the bar, uh, counting out money, giving drinks to Iskal, who I decided was eating the crisps. I just think he probably likes crisps. And now for something completely different. I'm in a hole and I'm murdering some cows. Murder, murder cows. <laughs> Back on the pirate theme, we find good times with Scar complaining for two videos that he can't build sailboats, then building a super pretty sailboat. To be fair, it doesn't have exactly a sail, as its mast is holding two Zeppelin balloons, but the jury is still out on what to call this bizarre vehicle that, according to lore, doesn't fly nor sail, and instead hydroplanes across the ocean. Hyperplane across the water to, you know, speed up their progression towards the Royal Jelly Navy. The Royal Jelly Navy is very far behind these fascinating ships, marvels of their time. <laughs> Scar is also the one hermit you would expect to do well at Storage Wars, as he's been fighting his own shulker boxes for as long as there were shulker boxes. But no, his trip to the Cat in a Bag auction ends with a creeper taking out a chunk of the underground redstone responsible for this whole peekaboo mechanic. Storage Wars security? I'll assure you, I did not enter the premises. I've been a good- <gasps> You distracted me so that creeper landed on me. How dare you! Thankfully for the head of Cherry Computers, there should be no problem putting it back together. That's if he has any stock left after Impulse is finished shopping there. Keen to modernize the eye trade experience, Impulse adds indicator lights to show when there are books in stock, and item filters to remove any diamonds dropped into the chests. And then, when he's squeezed all of that into the smallest possible space, he has to do it 36 more times. Am I brave enough to go? I think we better design the next part before I do the rest. At least there's some time to blow off steam with the server's latest reality TV inspired distraction. Ooh, now we're talking my language. Look at this. 64 by Ren Diggity Dog. Seriously, Ren? What? <laughs> what do you need Redstone for, man? A reality show of its own, in the meantime, continues unfolding in Hermitville. It's once again time to check in on Sahara Street, if only to feel good about how our own builds don't try to eat each other. Last time you heard from us, Green had promised to conclude the whole thing with one brilliant yet insane plan. That plan got eaten by his lack of Minecraft playing time, so he's doing a dragon instead. Not that we're complaining, dragons are epic. So what I was going to do was go full transformer mode on this house. I was going to give it shoulders made out of houses, arms made out of houses, and a big old face made out of houses. And it didn't it didn't look so good, guys. It I've decided not to do that. They don't do much against rockets though, nor apparently do rockets against Grian's house. The one Iskal stuck in it after the magnet trick remained well stuck in it. Nothing about it made the house cluster any shorter, guess he just felt like being mean to him that day. In true spy vs spy manner, Grian responds with a spring-loaded boxing glove punching into Iskal's aquarium. This also does nothing to affect the height of either build, but might be cathartic if mindless violence against fish is your thing. Now outdone by a few blocks, Scar uses what radiation his plant has left to grow it even taller into a storming cloud of yellow lightning. Inspired obviously by the Jack and the Beanstalk fairy tale, he plans to put the giant's castle on top of it. Fee fi fo fum etc, the promise of the blood of an Englishman is actually pretty threatening in this particular situation. And this is uh, Unintentional Mob Farm number 386, by the way. This thing spawns so many mobs. What Green is not outdone in yet is his own elytra course, even if false symmetry came a bit too close for comfort to beating him. The profits from the many attempts everyone made on it came really handy when he thought of placing a bid in Storage Wars. Or they would if the diamonds he just put in his ender chest half an episode earlier didn't mysteriously disappear. You can start placing bets on which of his alternative personalities took them. My, my diamonds have definitely gone. That is really weird. I've never seen anything like this before. 
As for false symmetry, the mere presence of storage walls reminds her of all the shops she had in the area bringing in the money, so she takes a quick detour from adding even more detail to the walls surrounding the medieval district to catch up on the profits and the lack thereof in all of the false owned establishments. We're doing well so far. Someone has bought me out of ink sacks. Have Sahara bought me out? Oh my goodness. Although I don't know if they make much of a profit on them. Let's have a quick look though. No. With the roses though. Hmm. And finally, there's Mumbo Jumbo, the architect of all these overpriced garage sales, who, for once, doesn't actually include the contents of the storage units in his video because he knows the comments section will cheat on behalf of their favourite hermits. So it's kind of like a blind auction. It's, it's, a, it's an auction for something that you've sort of seen but sort of haven't seen and you're hoping for some good surprises and not nasty surprises. People lose money, people make money. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting concept that I think will work well in Minecraft. And he also knows certain people won't read the book, which is why he leaves a sign specifically for one of them. Waiting for people to wager their wallets away, he returns to the Hermitville build contest and raises the white flag. A very tall white flag built out of fences and wool and technically taller than everyone else's builds so far, so it's a surrender and a flex at the same time. But it wouldn't be Mumbo without farming something, so he adds a TNT powered concrete maker to the collection of industrial machines at his witch farm perimeter. After collecting some sand and gravel, neither of which he had in any great quantity, he gets to finally use it and surprisingly it doesn't blow itself up first time, which basically just means we still have something to look forward to. And that's just about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixorifs. If you've been wondering where Tango Tech is, he's been hard at work on his Techtopia mod, and if you want to see Zloy do his best to screw it up, there's a link to that in the end screen theater this week. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.